So good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin the study this morning with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all the things that you've given us to do. Um, the things that we do each day and how they teach us lessons about Christ and how your word uh, interacts uh, with our day-to-day -day lives. We just pray, Lord, that as we spend the time each morning studying together and on our own, and that the things that we learn from your word will guide us in our day-to-day -day decisions, in our interactions with others, uh, that we may reflect your character, and that we may learn the lessons that we need to help us to depend upon you at all times. Be with us now as we open your word together. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. And may you guide and, and direct us and correct any errors we may have in our understanding. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so um, we're going to move on to Judges chapter 6, 7, and 8, dealing with um, Gideon. Now, we spend a lot of time... Um, uh, studying Gideon. Um, basically, we've approached Gideon. I mean, this would really be the third time that we're looking at Gideon um, in that uh, we looked at Gideon uh, earlier in our studies, in our morning studies, and then we looked at Gideon again when we got to Judges. And then we looked at Gideon again. Um, now we're looking at Gideon again. But we had drawn out Gideon on, on lines already, that we haven't applied uh, those lines within the other structures, and we haven't named the waymarks. We haven't identified a period of darkness, time of the end, formalization, etc. So we're going to look at, at those lines. Now, since we, we've studied Gideon quite a bit in this movement, and we understand the role uh, that that Gideon has as a symbol, because Jeff applied Gideon to um, this movement in the separation from Parminder's movement and into the proclamation of July 18th and December 25th, 2021. So when we looked at uh, Gideon, we saw that there was the three chapters, six, seven, and eight represented the three dates um, November 9th, July 18th, and December 25th, 2021, that we zoomed into uh, these dates, if I remember correctly. Um, so that they were, uh, each one itself was a line. Um, though we, we understood that there is a line of Gideon that's uh, complete in and of itself, which we didn't really address when we drew up the line of Gideon. Um, so we're just going to read through this first part really quickly to remind us of some of the details here. So get rid of the Hebrew numbers there so it's easier to read. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Now, uh, this reminds me of um, Ellen White talks about how... Uh, now, she's speaking really directly of Deuteronomy, but she is including in that statement uh, Leviticus 26 by implication. Um, that, uh, that this scattering of God's people would, had a partial fulfillment in the period of the judges, uh, but had a more uh, complete fulfillment. I'm not, and I, I might be, I can't remember if she uses the word complete, but something similar to that, complete fulfillment in um, the captivity of, no of Israel by Assyria and the captivity of Judah by Babylon. So one of the things is we can see that the seven times is occurring in this period of the judges, but it's, it's occurring in the sense that God's people are being judged by Leviticus 26 and, and the blessings and curses uh, of Deuteronomy 28. But they are repenting 
and God continues to restore them. Once we get into what happens with uh, Ephraim, you know, with Samaria and its ultimate end, uh, the Leviticus 26 has an application there. And then we see the same thing, of course, with the four or seven times as they're applied to Judah. But so this seven years here, there are periods, other periods of seven years mentioned in the Bible. And so this seven years here reminds us of the seven times. So it is, it is a seven, right? It's uh, uh, a judgment of seven. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they had camped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel great, was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, uh, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the God of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. So, of course, we see this here, what this period of darkness is. Um, you know, literally here for them, it is this uh, Midianite oppression and this impoverishment. And that happens for a period of seven years. And there is a prophet that had been sent prior to the call of Gideon because they had, had cried out to God. So then we have the call of Gideon. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Oprah, that pertained unto Joash the Abba Ezrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry till thou come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of an ephah, a flour, the flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot and brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay, the, lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah of the Ebezerites. 
And it came to pass that same night that the Lord called it, uh, oops. and it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, take thy father's young bullock, even a second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God on, upon the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock, and offer a burnt sacrifice with wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants, and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household, and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, Who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son that he may die, because he, has, he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye serve, save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning. For if he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore on that day he called him Jerubbaal, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and Abiezer was gathered after him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher and unto Zebulun and unto Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early in the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. Um, so hopefully that brings to mind the, the way that we understood these passages now when we go to the lines that we had drawn out <clears throat> uh, let's try to review these things and then decide what to do with them um, so we have november 9th so this is the line of gideon from chapter 6 though it's not going to include the call um, that's going to be the next line but um so this this line of gideon the first line starts with november 9th 1989 and we have there the prophet in judges 6 verse 8 so we're looking at that, that period from the time of the end in our history to september 11th so if we're going to apply um, this as the period of darkness, what would be the basis for doing so? Um, how, how would we understand this? So the Midianites, the Midianites are the darkness. And so what would be the darkness that precedes we would say September 11th is the time of the end, but notice we also marked it as November 9th. So what were we doing there in our application of Judges chapter 6? People remember. Uh, 
that's too good. Right? Yeah, somewhat. I could, was it this the chapter that we started noticing the the years? We're kind of corresponding, or was that earlier? Um, well, there's going to be, I mean, I think we sort of were seeing it throughout Judges. So Judges chapter 2, we had lined up a September 11th with Judges 2 verse 1, and Judges 2 23 was 2023. So we took 1 to 23 representing the years from 2001, the 2 representing the 2000. Right. And then the verses representing the years. That's what you're asking about. So so the idea is that we have September 11th is this line, but we always have a period of darkness that precedes a line. Right. So we're taking November 9th, 1989 to September 11th, but we're also placing November 9th, 2019 with September 11th. So this is where we address the idea that these two dates are tied together. That September 11th and November 9th represent the same symbol, but on different lines. So in, in trying to separate, separate out these lines, remember what we had done uh, uh, last week where we could take um, November 9th um, well, we would take our two September 11ths in our line, that is uh, the empowerment of the first angel and the arrival of the second, and then we just flipped the one around and we could see that we were in a different line, but these lines are intertwined with each other. So, so this line goes to September 11th as the period of darkness, but November 9th parallels September 11th because this is addressing uh, the history of this movement in this separation after the death of um, Parminder. So this is dealing with that, what happens after November 9th in this movement. Does that make sense? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, so when we when we look at, at the line of the judges itself, I'm gonna go up here, the judges line, right? So Gideon is the empowerment of the first angel in this whole line of the judges that is addressing or focused upon November 9th, right? So, so this line, of course, starts at 9-11, but Gideon itself has this tie between 9-11 and 11-9 um, because this is this way mark. So this is the way mark that we are examining when we examine Gideon. We're examining the empowerment of this first angel with the judges line being a reform line that is um, is zooming into a line above it, whatever line that is, right? So that's what we um, understand. And so that's one of the things that we struggled with is, is ju the judges line zooming into the 9-11 that is the empowerment of the first angel, or is it a zoom in to the 9-11 that's the arrival of the second, right? So that was one of the things that we had to address. And so the judge's line appears, from my understanding, and different times I've, I've, I've struggled with it, but it definitely addresses the movement, even though 9-11 is the same way mark, or the same event, but two different waymarks, that is the empowerment of the first and the arrival of the second, that we would have to look at it as the arrival of the second when we're looking at how our line is interacting with those bigger lines.
Because as we continue to zoom in, that 9-11 way mark, um, first it arrived in, in our message and it changed the way we looked at our lines. But initially it was uh, the empowerment of the first angel. You know, if you're looking back like 2004, right? So we're gonna be seeing it as the empowerment of the first angel, but the mo movement itself hadn't uh, gotten there yet. So when we look at Othniel, Ehud and Shamgar, and we start to realize that really this is about November 9th, when we're looking at the judge's line, even though it's using this 9-11 symbol, it's the 9-11 symbol that's the, the, the arrival of the second angel. And so, so this whole line is a zoom into 9-11, but in this second angel aspect, right? So when, when we started to understand that um, Revelation 18 is this mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down at 9-11. So then we have 9-11 serving these two purposes, especially once we start to understand that 9-11 parallels uh, Millerite history with the arrival of the second angel on the first day of the first month. So this develops in our movement. And so when we look at Gideon here, it's the empowerment of the first angel, but this is, um, this is in a sense, the first angel. So in some ways, and, and this just gets, see what we have to do is we have to be able to parse out these lines better, right? And, and I think that's part of the, uh, what we're doing here with the judges is we're, we're taking this line, we're seeing this history, and we can see that the story of Gideon is really more about the second angel arriving than it is, that is the 9-11, that's the second angel arriving, than it is about the empowerment of the first angel with 9-11. Does that make sense to people? Because that's, I mean, that's what we decided, but it's uh i believe we established that that's kind of logical yeah okay <clears throat> so then when we look at this line of gideon um here so so we have this line of gideon and we're looking at these uh way marks that we had we we, we didn't mark, you know, this as the time of the end or, or anything like that. Um, but now we would have to. So we're going to say that uh, the period of darkness, even though you see September 11th here, 2001, we also see November 9th, 2019. And so we know these two are symbolized together. And now we can see why we can we can call them the same symbol. Uh but they serve a different purpose on different lines to some degree. So this period of darkness that goes from November 9th, 1989, um, where we have Jeff, who's the prophet that is given, though this is connected also to the spirit of prophecy in Judges 6-8, because uh, Jeff's role as uh, the first messenger, messenger goes up to September 11th, 2001, though he still continues on uh, like Miller did during the time of snow. But that this, this November 9th, 2019 date is marking the end of a period of darkness. So this period of darkness is this 30 years in this movement. So we know it's the Midianite oppression. So what is the period of darkness? That, that we have been dealing with that, that's being addressed by the line of Gideon. So it's the Amalekites, the children of the East, and the Midianites. They're oppressing Israel. So what are they symbolizing?
uh, are you implying the darkness? That yes, they so, are. Yeah, so they're the darkness, they're the oppression. But what are they symbolizing that we get a time of the a time of the oh. end, November 9th, two thousand nineteen. So uh, I thought we were we determined that the Midianites uh, was the uh, the way we look at things uh, as uh, our our understanding versus Protestant understanding of uh, prophecy and the lines. Okay. Um, well, um, when we address the Midianites here, they mean strife. Midian refers to strife. Right. What? What? I. We know that 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 that's part of it. It has to do with the Protestant understanding. But the idea here is that this is the strife that is ex existing within this movement. Oh, oh. Right? So right. We have a way in which conflict has been dealt with and conflict has been initiated, right? So we can see when we look at, at what had happened with um, the separation that began in 2014, right? So we have this strife and this strife comes from this critical judgment of others. So even the judgments that were given about Jeff, when, when I first came into the movement in 2010, uh, the sort of grumblings and, and complaining that was happening regarding, um, you know, at, at the Oklahoma uh, prophecy school or whatever you want to call it, the meetings, in Oklahoma in 2010, um, there was this dissatisfaction with the fact that Jeff had appointed some people to do presentations on the same topic that he was doing, as if he was controlling what they, they were doing. And, and there was also the differences regarding the book of Joel. So, so these things and, and how they were dealt with, um, rumors and gossip, allowed separation to occur. Um, and so this strife is this Midianite oppression. That's the way that uh, we, we sort of understood this. So November 9th is now this separation that occurs from Parminder's movement, but this still needs to be addressed. And so the whole idea here is that this is being addressed um, by this, these lines of Gideon, because they're addressing specifically what's happening with internally within the movement uh, with these various waymarks. As we move through this history, we have November 9th, 2019, we have the start of the 777 days. And, um, and then we're taking this, these, each of these chapters as these separate lines, repeating these histories but giving us other details. So, so that's how we understood it. Um, and that's why November 9th becomes this uh, arrival of this message. Now, when we addressed um, uh, yesterday, dealing, and dealing with the 273 that was presented on November 9th, 2019, uh, there are a number of issues that that um, that arise at that time. So, you know, so one of the things is starts to really, um, you know, hit close to home as we examine these lines because these are things that we're presently involved in, and and to some degree have emotional um, impact on various people. That is. Uh, the movement ha is in disunity largely because of human emotions, human biases, subjective understandings about other people are in. That, that's agreeable. Yeah. And, you know, the fact is we all have faults and defects in character. And so it's always easy to criticize a person because you can always find fault somewhere. Right? Because if they could fall, find fault with Christ, who was perfect, 
you definitely can find fault with, with us who are imperfect. Uh, to say the very least. Yeah. So, you know, we need to be guided by the truths in God's word, not by personalities and feelings and all those things that, that we have. I mean, if we were doing what God asked us to do, we would just be looking at what's being studied and we would separate that from how we feel about the people who are presenting things. But as human nature controls us, it, it causes us to like some people and dislike other people. You know, we like certain personalities and we like certain ways that people teach. And, and you know, we, we value our own uh, perspectives and opinions, right? So we all do that. But through the work of the Holy Spirit, we need to be able to uh, overcome those human biases and tendencies so that we can see truth for what it is. And, you know, what was happening in the movement prior to November 9th, and it still happened, is that people will listen to stories about someone. And those stories may be true partially, sometimes even, even completely, but that that should not be the basis for how we decide what is truth. Because we don't understand what's happening in a person's heart. We don't understand the motives of the situations. Um, and, and we use this as a way of deciding who we're going to follow, so to speak, which is not wise. Because one is we are, we are to follow Christ, not man. Right. But we, but we have this tendency to depend upon the opinions of others. Yes, and, we do. And and it's easy to do, you know, like if there's somebody who, you know, they sort of speak our language and, and uh, uh, you know, we, we can connect with what they're saying. Well, then we're going to tend to, well, you know, I'm going to watch this person's presentations. I get the most out of it. And then when situations arise, then we, we sympathize with that person and, and take a critical eye um, upon those that may be criticizing the person that we, we you know, identify with. We, we can take it personally. Um, and that's, of course, an extremely dangerous thing to do. So we need to know what is truth based upon God's word alone. And also, when we Isn't see it rule five, wasn't well, it rule five? I can't remember the number of the rules, but you know, he said. I think it was uh, the conclusion of it was um, uh, if somebody's uh, guess, if I'm a, you know, if I'm into his guess, then I'm. It's not. That's not it. Yeah. Oh, right. I so if I, yeah, if I depend upon the teacher to expound it to me. Right. And he guess at his meaning or desire to have it so on account of his sectarian creed or just personal bias or to be thought wise, then he is guessing. Desire, then his guessing, desire, creed or wisdom is my rule, not the Bible. Right. So we don't follow man. Correct. That's rule five, basically. Yes. So that that's an important uh, principle. And, but I see it happen all the time um, within Adventism, within Christianity, people have their favorite speaker. And, and so when their speaker has some opinion, well, it's all, almost as if God's word had said it. Because the person hasn't studied it out themselves. They don't know if what that person is saying is true or not. So, you know, they, they just accept it. And... You know, and that's really the danger of being a speaker, you know, like, you know, me presenting and, you know, there's there's always this tendency to have these sort of uh, hangers on. Right. You know, people who just say, oh, you know, Theodore said this. It's, it's got to be true. Um, but that's that's not really very helpful. I mean, that's not what you want to have as a teacher. You want people to be able to learn on their own and to discover things for themselves. And if I'm in error about something, I need to be corrected. Right. So, so it's useful to have people 
who are Bereans. We're all to be Bereans. We're all to examine these things. Jeff sought that as well. He didn't want people just following him. He wanted to be corrected. But you, what you don't do is just attack the person. And because it, it is actually counterproductive to that whole process. Because when you start attacking people, you're much more inclined to get people following people because out of sympathy, right? It, it becomes more political than, than scriptural, scriptural. And so the idea of attacking a person because they, they hold some opinion differing from yours, um, that has infected this movement for years. And part of that is that's how we have reacted to the church. We'll listen to a speaker. Some speaker has says something that we believe to be an error. And then we start to believe stories about that person with, without treating that person as if they're actually a, an individual human being who's, who doesn't understand the truth fully. We see them almost as enemies. And so, you know, this, this is something that has to stop in this movement and i believe that that's the process that we've been going through with these predictions with these lines with these dates and not just to december 25th 2021 but also with colin's prediction so we may think that we understand why god gives us dates and we think oh this is you know here we have this structure and so now we can project into the future and we can figure what's going to happen. But what God's doing right now is internally within this movement. He's allowed these, um, these lines to bring us to a point where we can come together in the upper room, so to speak, and see uh, what we have done to hurt others and to repent and confess our sins, our wrongs that we have caused. That is the purpose of these lines, not to predict some event in the future. Because in order to be ready for the events that are coming upon us, it's not enough. If we knew when they were going to occur, if we knew when the second coming was going to occur, would that change us? Would that knowledge save us? No. Uh, no. Because it didn't save the Millerites. Because they really believed that Jesus was coming back. But when he failed to return, the true, uh, the true view of themselves or the, of what they were as people, that crisis revealed of what kind of people they were. So they may have imagined themselves ready for Christ to return, but they were not ready. We may have imagined ourselves ready for what was going to come when, you know, with July 18th, that we were ready for the Sunday law because we know what's going to happen. But the knowing what's going to happen isn't enough to prepare us. We have to have a work done upon our hearts where we trust in God in spite of what we see and uh, that we can work in unity with one another to accomplish the work that he's given us to do. So if we haven't even done the work that he's asked us to do, why should we expect the reward, so to speak? So, so this is, I think, the darkness. And, and so that's what this, these lines are addressing. So when we look at November 9th, 2019, Sisera is gone, right? Parminder is out of the movement. But this, there is still a, a problem that exists within the movement, and that's the Midianite oppression. That's the strife. 
that exists among brethren. So, so when we look at these waymarks here, um, because we didn't uh, particularly draw these with, with the intent of creating a line, um, but you can see here we have um, these particular dates based on these verses. And we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven way marks here. And we have this one way mark here. So this is November 9th, 1989. But it's this is the period of darkness ending on November 9th, 2019. So this would be the arrival of the first message. And the message specifically is the 273 in, in, in the other line. Right. So in the other line, we have the 273 um, dealing with uh, um, what well, name escapes me. Uh, the line we just did. Uh, Barack and Deborah and Barack. Right. So it brought us to November 9th and this message to the Levites. And so this message to the Levite symbol is addressing the fact that if we are going to give the message to the Levites, we first have to have a message to give. And that means we have to have a character that is going to be able to um, draw people to Christ. So November 9th, 2019, 11-9, is the arrival of a message dealing with the Levites from the previous line. Yeah, that's agreeable. Yeah, okay. Now, of course, here, we're, we're not dealing, at least I don't see the symbols for the 273 because it's not part of, of how this line is unfolding. Uh, one is we don't see any March 27th in this line. Yeah, because... We related that 273 to be 327, right? Yeah. And so so we don't see that, that in this line. That is, it's not it's not a prominent waymark in, in these lines here. Now, um, so so we have this this uh, period of oppression here, right? And, and we can see it in two different ways. We can see it from 1989 to 2001. And that is uh, a period basically of 20, what, 21 years, right? 22 years? 22 years, yeah. So 22 years. But then it also goes to 2019, which is 30 years. Right? So really it's... It's, it's that November 9th date, the 30 years, that, that's important here in this line. Now, remember, Stephen first came up with November 9th, 2019, based upon a study relating to, um, which, which is rather involved, but part of it was relating to um, the number of years uh, 1844 years of um, 359 days that is with the days of atonement taken out so prophetic symbol with the day of atonement taken out going up to October 22 1844 and counting 1844 days from October 22 1844 to November 9th um, 18 um, so it would be 1849. Should be about right. So November 9th, 1849. And yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. And so, so, but that's before he knew about Tess's date. And and Tess would have had that date for quite a while, I would think. Oh, and that was one other thing just, just to mention, which I didn't mention. I was going to mention it uh, yesterday. 
um, for the day before. But one of the things about Tess's prediction of November 9th, uh, Tess was born when? November 9th, I think it's uh, 1990. Okay, so November 9th, 1990. Okay. And she, she is born uh, 391 and a half days after who? AOC. Yeah, so AOC is born on October 13th, 1989, right? So this relationship between Tess and AOC, AOC is Tess's hero, right? But um, is it, um, hang on here. So it's, yeah, so we got, and, and AOC was born at noon on October 13th, 1989. So, and so at the count to, uh, so Tess is born 391 and a half uh, days later. So, so the thing that's interesting is when I had that October 13th, 2018 and I counted the 391 and a half to November 9th uh, 2019 that was going to be Tess's uh, 29th birthday right she turned 29 on November 9th 19 because she's born in 1990 that's correct right Stephen did I get that all correct Yes, she would. Uh, yeah, she'd be twenty nine. Yeah, two thousand nineteen. So yeah. Okay. And and so the significance there is we have this this false message which uh, is going to be based upon this understanding of chronology uh, that that actually um, test doesn't accept. She doesn't accept the three ninety one point five, even though it connects her to AOC. And, and it gives this witness to November 9th, 2019. I mean, she told me, I don't accept the 391. Um, uh, this was in 2019, in June 2019, she told me that. Um, so, of course, she didn't probably know about the connection with AOC or anything like that. But you can see that it it's something that um, it bears witness to this counterfeit message that it, it has some of the same elements, even though they're not, you know, they're, you know, it's, it's a false message. So, so anyway, the point is that on November 9th, 2019, we find this uh, spike in the head of Cicero uh, put in by JL. Right. And so that this is, um, dealing with this understanding of chronology. Um, but there is a message that gets honor, and we would have to say that this message is the message to the Levites. And that that message to the Levites isn't July 18th. July 18th is for this movement. So, so we have this November 9th, 2019 date arrive. It has all of these symbols attached to it. But then, and, and what's being addressed there is we look at Judges 6.11. So in Judges 6.11, the verse says, and there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an Oprah that pertained to Joash the Ebezrite. Eb and his son Gideon threshed wheat from the wine press to hide from it from the Midianites. So when we put that symbol there at November 9th, we can see that we're tying in that mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down on September 11th as the arrival of the second angel. 
and that it's tied to November 9th, 2019. So does a mighty angel of Revelation 18 arrive on November 9th, 2019? How, how would we characterize that? Because it happens on September 11th. It's the arrival of the second angel. So how is November 9th, 2019, also the arrival of the second angel? Now here it's it's the arrival of the first angel, right, in, in this line. If we're going to say this is the time at the end, then this is the arrival of the first angel. But it's the arrival of the second angel. Because we have the symbol there of this mighty angel coming down, which is, is Christ. That's September 11th. But how does that relate to November 9th? From what we know about November 9th. So I'm not sure what you're looking for. Uh, I, I didn't quite understand how you're proposing this question. Okay, so we have the symbol of September 11th lined up with November 9th. And we mark Judges 611 because um, we have the angel of the Lord coming, which is Christ. Right, Christ is coming to, to Gideon, right, on Judges 611. And so we can line, line that up with September 11th, but we're also lining it up with November 9th, 2019. So do we really recognize what, what was given to us as a message on November 9th, 2019? We're saying it's the number 273, because those are the two presentations that were given on November 9th. And, and we're saying that they do represent the gospel. Right. This is, you know, the, the spike is, you know, this is about righteousness by faith, the nail in the sure place. So can we see November 9th also, just like September 11th, 2001, having the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down? Because that's the Sunday law, right? So. We know the Sunday law is still future. The mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down at the Sunday law. But in our line, we, we see that our line is a zoom into the Sunday law. So September 11th is included in that. Right? That's, that's what we learn by putting the mighty angel of Revelation 18 at September 11th. But can we also place it at November 9th? Because that's what we have to do when we, when we, look at this line we have to see that they're lining up with each other so this whole line this whole line of Gideon is about the Sunday law about the second angel's message arriving in our history but now it's arriving as the first angel in this line with November 9th but it still is the second angel hopefully that's not confusing to people Because in, if you zoom into the into a waymark like the second angel's message, you still can have all of those lines represent all of those waymarks in some ways representing the second angel arriving. Because you're zoomed into the second angel 
arriving. And so just because we have a line of it, and, and that's what we're understanding that, that our whole history is. Our whole history is zooming into this line of 9-11 being the arrival of the second angel. Right? So when we look at the judge's line, this is a zoom into 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel. But we can see that when we take this judge's line, it's going to start with September 11th, right? But 11-9 but is going to be the empowerment of that first angel. So since the story of Gideon is, is on this line that is a zoom into the arrival of the second angel, that is 9-11, and the first way mark on this line is 9-11, and the empowerment is 11-9, can we not see then that when we look at this line of Gideon, which I have to find again, It's a different line. I should remember the slide number. Uh, here it is, um, four, six, seven. So when we look into the line of Gideon here, this line, this is a zoom into the empowerment of the first angel on a line that's a zoom into the arrival of the second angel, which is 9-11. And so we can see that this is naturally what would result, that this symbol of the second angel would show up here on the arrival of the first angel. Does that make more sense? Or did I just confuse people? It is more information. Okay. There's a lot to this, especially in in having to examine the various lines mm -hmm. that can at times be confounding if you're not able to completely pay attention to all of the different things that are going on. Yeah, but because we have to keep this all in our minds. Right. I mean, uh, I, I'm just going to draw this on the whiteboard, try to help people a little bit visually. So um, now it's easy for me to hold things in my, in my visual uh, mind. Right? So it's not it's not as easy for everyone. Some people have that skill better than others. So we'll just parse out this line. And so we know we have this line here. So we got uh, 1844, right? The third angel arrives and it carries all the way through this history. And then we're going to have the Sunday law. And at the Sunday law, the second angel arrives. You probably can't see that. That's better. <laughs> okay. So the second angel arrives here at the Sunday law, which is connected with the empowerment of the third angel. Um, you know, it's the third angel being empowered. This is this history. So in Ellen White's understanding, we have this way mark of the Sunday law. But now when we zoom into this Sunday law, we get this line.
right? And you got Midnight and the Midnight Cry here as well, right? Where Ellen White puts, of course, the loud cry over here, and then the close of probation. So that's her, her line. But we, we then zoom into this Sunday law, and we get these this way mark here. So we get this 9-11. Now, in doing this, remember 9-11 has two different roles. It's the empowerment of the first angel and it's the arrival of the second. And so we're zooming into this line here. Uh, but in zooming into this line, we have a line that looks like this. So, um, so when we when we did this, I mean, I guess the next le level down, the way that I would understand it, has to do with this line, eleven nine to December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one, right? And that's the seven 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 right there. Yeah, that's the seven seven seven. So we're saying that that our line here is is zoom into it, but I think that there's still another line above this. That is, even in this line, this line here is is actually a zoom into. Um, in some ways, it's a zoom into nine eleven, right? Because if we were Really going to create this line here, so I'll do it this way. So we know that when we zoomed into the Sunday law, initially what we had was um, so, you know, we have these two. You know, we got 1798 over here, right? And so, so we didn't really just have, you know, 911. We had to have 1989 here, or something like that. And know? so this is the Millerite line versus our line. Yeah. So as we as we started to look at our line, we saw we saw that we repeated history. And what Jeff initially had was 1989, the Sunday Law, the close of probation. Right. So, could say it was just this, right? That's all his line did, is it just created another time of the end from Daniel 11, verse 40b, showing that we're repeating Millerite history. The close of probation here would be October 22. The Sunday law wasn't really defined other than uh, that it's compared to um, uh, the uh, the history connected with the, the arrival of the second angel's message, right? So not specifically a date, so to speak. And then you're going to have the loud cry, right? So so he has the loud cry coming, um, as Ellen White did. So he would then you know say the loud cry parallels the midnight cry. So, so he goes over here, he takes this history, you have in here the second angel arriving, whatever, you know, at different times this was different events, and then you had the midnight cry. And so he just basically took this as a repeat of Millerite history and then lined it up with this history. So, you know, it ends up But you understand what I'm saying. So that's what Jeff was doing initially. But we kept zooming in. So that line still is valid, right? I mean, this idea that this is just the arrival of the second angel, which is the fourth angel of Revelation 18, happens at the Sunday law. Right? This is Revelation 18. And then is followed the loud cry. And then the close of probation and the seven last plagues and the second coming and the millennium, all that stuff, right? This is still what we believe. We, we haven't abandoned this line because this is clearly presented in the spirit of prophecy. So when Jeff initially 
understood this repeat of history. It was just a repeat of the first and second angels' messages before the Sunday law. And so since in this history of the first and second angels' message, the Sunday law is a closed door, so for Seventh-day Adventists, the Sunday law becomes a closed door. So we have this special history that is needed for Adventists to give the loud cry, right? It's just a very simple idea. But every time we zoom in, we, we weren't really understanding that we were on a separate line. So what we ended up coming to believe is that we have 1989, and then we have midnight and the midnight cry, as if this is all a part of this big line, but it isn't. It's a zoom into this line or this way mark. So this is actually not just that, it's, you know, when we lay it out, we have to have all of this, right? So if we zoom into this Sunday law, this is really the Sunday law is the close of probation, right? On this line, the Sunday law precedes the loud cry, which precedes the close of probation. So if we, if we draw this line and say this is 1989, then we have to be taking all of this history from Millerite history and expanding it out. And that's what we ended up doing. So we, we looked at Millerite history in more detail and we saw that there was um, uh, 1996, that's going to be the formalization of the message. It's not all drawn here. So that would be taking this history, putting it like this. And then we would have 9-11, which is, you know, so this is the time at the end. This is parallel to 1833. And this is parallel to August 11th, 1840. Right. But then we have a 9-11 again, which is, April 19th, 1844, right? So this is all this history expanded out here. And then we, of course, saw that there was um, what we call midnight, which is Boston, and then the midnight cry, which is Exeter. So now all of this Millerite history this all comes before the Sunday law, but that's because this is for this, this line here is for Seventh day Adventists, right? Seventh day Adventists need to be prepared for the Sunday law. And so we're looking at this date here, 9 11, as the, the, the arrival of the second angel, but we haven't come on this line. We haven't come to midnight yet, right? Correct. Because this movement is developing Samuel Snow's message, and it's the prediction before midnight. So that's what we've been involved in. So then when we look at a line, we can create a line by looking at zooming into 1989. You can create a line by zooming into 1996. You can create a line by zooming into 9-11 as it relates to August 11th, 1840. You can also zoom into 9-11 as it uh, um, relates to April 19th, 1844. So we believe that we are zoomed into this line or this way mark presently. And, and I had trouble trying to figure out, were we zoomed into the mid, midnight way mark? And was our history just part of that? It's leading to that, but we're not zoomed into this way mark yet. Because when we zoom into this way mark, different events will unfold that create a reform line. So, so we kept looking for, well, are we at midnight in the midnight cry? And when we would have something that was representing midnight, we would think we're on this line. But 
here is the Sunday law, right? This is the Sunday law here. And are we looking for a Sunday law in the next six months or seven months or a year or something like that in this movement? Not really. Well, some people in this movement are, right? Because well, we, yeah. had, we had a type of the Sunday law in the pandemic and people believed, well, we're just going to keep, this is going to continue. This is part of this Sunday law. But we can see that we haven't even got to Boston yet. Right? We're in this. Not on this line. This is Samuel Snow's letter. No. So we're on this line. There are still events that are going to happen. And this line is a line in which the Seventh day Adventist church, the Levites, are going to, because this is a reform line that starts with the church, the corporate structure, the Seventh day Adventist church, and then moves to the members, right? Right. Just as in Millerite history, you had the Protestants and the Millerites. You now have the Seventh day Adventist church and the members themselves. We call them the Levites. Right. So, so what happened in Boston that made it midnight? Well, it was midnight. It was it was declared as midnight. So Samuel Snow's in Boston. He's saying that we're midway. Ellen White says that the midnight cry was given midway. Um, it is exactly halfway between the first day of the first month, April 19th, and October 22, 1844, right? So it's going to be exactly halfway. So it's midway. He declares that it's midnight. because and that was his declaration. I mean, that's what he was trying to make everybody understand. Yeah, he says we're midway. Now, he wasn't counting to the day. He was just counting to the months, you know, a night. So if this is sunset and this is sunrise, because they tarried, right? And so this is uh, Snow's logic. Then midway would be where he was, right? Three months, because this is going to be six, six months, because this is a half of a year. And so midnight's going to be halfway. And, and so he says, well, there's six months and we're halfway. That's three months. So he's counting from April 19th to July 21st. That's three months. And then there's going to be three more months, right, to October 22. But we know it's exactly halfway. July 21st is exactly halfway. So. Yeah, we so do. This midnight. What's he that? didn't understand. We understand that now, but he didn't understand that then. No, he wasn't counting the days because he actually didn't even have October 22 as a date yet. These are one of our, our learning experiences that we picked up here along the way. This is this is one of those things that ha was kind of disagreeable with people, but this is a fact. Yeah. So so once we had Exeter as the first day of the first month, right, because this is the fifth day of the fourth month. And you, and you can see if you if you take fifth day of the fourth month and 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 you understand you got from the first day of the first month and you got the 10th day of the seventh month, that the fifth day of the fourth month is going to be halfway between the 10th day of the seventh month. Just because you're you're three months and five days from the first day of the first month and another three months and five days brings you to the 10th day of the seventh month. You add three months to four, you're going to get seven. You get five to five, you get 10, right? But once we understood that this was the first day of the fifth month and that April 19th was the first day of the first month, then we could say, well, this event, which happened on July 21st, is going to be halfway. And so we now know, you know, you got July 21st and August August 15th, right? It's messy. Right? So, and, and these lined up with, you know, 457 BC. This lines up with Ezekiel chapter one, where he begins prophesying on the first day of the first month. And his last prophecy written is chapter 40, which is the 10th day of the seventh month. So he's got the fifth day of the fourth month to the 10th day of the seventh month. So Ezekiel also represents Millerite history. So, so anyway, this we now know is the line 
where midnight and midnight cry are on this line, but we do have midnights and midnight cries on other lines. And so what we didn't understand is what line we're on. It's just a pretty simple problem because we thought that these way marks are part of this line, but they're not, right? This doesn't belong to this line at all. It's just a zoom into the Sunday law, right? So all of this line is a zoom into this way mark that Ellen White talks about. And 9-11, and we can say 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel's message. But Ellen White says 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel's message at the Sunday law, right? So she puts the second angel arriving here. And then we put it over here, 9-11. And, and so people thought we're moving the way marks. But all we were doing was zooming into a way mark and recognizing that it is also a reform line. This is what we have, have come to understand clearly since July 18, which we didn't understand as a movement before July 18th. And, and we don't still understand yet, that is as a movement, we don't, right? So unless you've been following these studies, we wouldn't know this quite yet. So that's why people here before midnight can be saying, well, the Sunday law is imminent. Now, in some ways it is, and, and, and we don't really know until this way mark has passed, we may not really know where midnight is, right? One day we will be able to say that was midnight um, on this line, right? But we, we, we know we haven't got to it yet, okay? Is that, that helpful there? So then, you know, when we look at, at what we're zoomed into, we're zoomed into 9-11. And, and we would say that the line of the judges is illustrating 9-11. It's a zoom into that way mark. We, we still have to decide every time we, we draw out a line, and judges is helping us do that, that we can take all of these different events and dates and we can draw them on a line. So, so the line specifically that we're addressing or the way mark we're addressing is the arrival of the second angel's message. That's what this movement is, is about. It's about 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel's message. It was originally about the arrival of uh, the second angel's message in relationship to 9-11. Uh, or the as the so 9/11 was the empowerment of the first angel. So when 9/11 first happened, that's what we were focused upon. But now we're focused upon this arrival of the second angel in Millerite history. Once we zoomed in, once we understood Millerite history, we then moved into understanding April 19th. Right. So if we think about it as arrival of the second angel. We're actually in at April 19th, that first disappointment. Because that's the arrival of the second angel in Millerite history. So that's what we're focused upon presently. But that stretches out in a line of dates in our history that we can all mark as, you know, period of darkness, time of the end, formalization of the first angel, empowerment of the first angel, etc. right? And, and so then we can distinguish what line we're on. Without that, we have a bunch of events and way marks that don't really mean anything. Is that more clear? much uh, more help to my struggling mind. Okay. Well, good. 
because uh, I mean, this is something that we've we've been struggling with uh, in these studies of judges. <clears throat> so when we look at um, these lines here, so just to go back to the line of the judges, come on. Me. So when we have the judges line here, the judges line itself has to be a zoom into the arrival of the second angel's message as 9-11. But you can see that this judge's line has an arrival of the second angel's message itself, which is July 18, 2020. So, so this judge's line showing us our history, that is, um, this is about the prediction before midnight, but the judge's line is our primary step down, let's say, from that bigger line, not the big line, but the, the line that we have of our history from 1989 to the Sunday law, right? Because our line is a zoom into the Sunday law and Ellen White's line, that line, the line for Seventh-day Adventists, et cetera. But now the judge's line is a zoom into the arrival of the second angel. And we can see that this line illustrates um, Millerite history, just like all lines do. But we're going to have uh, these particular way marks as being different, if, different um, judges. Right? So all of them are going to have their particular characteristics. So we dealt with Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. We dealt with Deborah and Barak. And Gideon, we had drawn out the line, but we had not, um, we had not marked the way marks. Right? So that's, that's what we're in the process of doing. We, we didn't get very far today. But, but I think it's clearer now. I mean, it's clearer in my mind. So when we look, so just to finish off what we had started with, with this question about September 11th, 2001 and November 9th, 2019. Here we have one way mark with two different events, right? Yes. But, but they're the same way mark because we could take the two different September 11ths in our big line and we could flip one around, the second one, the one that applies to the second angel, and change it from 9-11 to 11-9. And that's because we're in a separate line. We're in this line from November 9th, 2019. We now have zoomed into the way mark that is 9-11, which is the, the, the arrival of the second angel. And we have then this history that the story of the judges is going to expand upon. And so the time of the end for the line of the judges is September 11th, 2001. But for the line of Gideon, which is the empowerment of that first angel, the time of the end is November 9th, 2019. So when the angel of the Lord comes down to Gideon, we have the prophet that precedes it of giving this message. We have the period of darkness with the prophet proclaiming that there's going to become a deliverer, right? And that that is going to be Gideon. And so when the angel comes down, the second angel has arrived. Right? In, well, the first angel has arrived. But it's also the second angel. Right? Because the first angel is September 11th. But, this, but the second angel, or the second message, would be November 9th. So we can line them up. Right in this way. 
So just like we can have two different way marks um, with the same event, we can have two different events with the same way mark. And it's not a separate line, so to speak, right? This is just this is just taking that line of the judges and now placing Gideon there. But he's really starting on November 9th, 2019, because we've we've already gone through the other history, the arrival of the first message and the formalization of this message. So now he's going to be the empowerment of that first message. Right. Any any questions about this? I mean, I personally think it's it's quite amazing what we've been able to understand from studying the book of Judges. And um, I'm really looking forward to the camp meeting this summer. And one of the things that, you know, we need to pray about is we want people to be there. You know, the people that need to hear uh, what we have discovered. And um, Heidi and I are going to call and study this Sabbath. So Saturday night, we're going to go there after we go to Warburg Church. So I won't be there again uh, for, the, I think it's the American group that does the study. Um, the Sabbath coming up, but um, uh, so we're going to go to call and study and I'm going to try to go there once a month. Um, but we need to be praying that, that the people in this movement are not going to allow uh, their personal feelings uh, dissuade them from coming uh, to the camp meeting this summer. You know, no matter how much they may dislike me or have feelings about me or what my goals or motives are, the reality is um, God has given us light and that light needs to be shared. And that light has to do primarily with the work that has to happen in us individually. But I don't think that we can appreciate it until we understand the lines. Because these lines have been a rebuke to us. Right? These are lines. Yes, yes. They're lines of judgment. And these are way marks of righteousness. Isaiah 28, right? So we have a line of judgment. God's people are being judged. They're being tested and proved. We're going through a three-step testing prophetic message. And and we're, we exist in a bunch of different lines that, the, that these... Uh, tests uh, are part of so we have to pass uh, the tests within a particular way mark uh, might have several different three part three step testing prophetic messages that we have to address and that's why we can't look at any of these way marks as a true close of probation that close of probation can happen when somebody rejects light so that can happen in a way mark but the close of probation on that big line of Ellen White's, that's the close of probation. And of course, it's not going to be easy once our probation is closed and God declares us as righteous because we go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Some events in anticipation are usually not as bad. Most events aren't as bad as the anticipation. But, but Ellen White says when it comes to that time, we can't imagine what that experience is going to be. So, um, so we can easily see that we can take this history and we can mark these way marks and we can do it on the next line. Morning. That there's going to be that. Oh, good. What's, up? What's that? What do I? Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, and so, I, I mean, we could easily just write, First angel arrives, the period of darkness for each of these other two lines is really the same period of darkness. 
It's just expressed in different series of events in our history with being parallel to different stories uh, and, and symbols mostly in, in Judges, right? So six, seven, and eight. If we wanted to line these up, we would say November 9th is um, beginning this period of darkness that ends on November 9th, 2019. And, and, but each one of these is going to have um, way marks. And, and so we have to decide you know, how we're gonna do this exactly. But uh, with this line, it's pretty straightforward. We have seven way marks. So we have the seven uh, way marks that we just mark them. And then to deciding how we do that with, with these lines as well. But I would say that you know, September 7, 2019 is the first angel arriving. And July 19, 2020 is the first angel arriving. So I don't think it should be hard to complete this section with Gideon because we've done so much work on it. So anyway, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful once again for what you have shown us. And we ask that we can continue to contemplate these things. We pray, Lord, for this movement, the people in it. Uh, we know, Lord, that you have given us light, and not just us, but others. And we pray, Lord, that um, we can come together and share what you have taught us, and that your spirit can do a mighty work in convicting and converting us so that we can give a message. Forgive us for our sins. Help us to trust in you. And bless each person we pray and ask. In Jesus' name, amen.